Good morning, friends. So it's the fourth Sunday of Lent, a joy to be here in worship. We've got two more weeks after this until Easter. Yay, Easter. Has everybody prepped for their Easter meals? You've got Easter in mind. Easter is coming. This is your warning, your two-week warning until Easter comes. For those of you at home, we are so glad that you are here with us. I am Pastor Leanne. Let us begin worship. Ms. Dakota, let me invite you to come forward and join, lead us in our opening prayer. And congregation, let me invite you to stand for our opening prayer. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Would you please join me in our opening prayer? We bask in the healing power of your love. You are always with us. You are with us when we cry out in fear. You are with us when we are discouraged. You are with us when we are alone. You are with us all the time, day and night. For your presence, we are most thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. have been walking in the wilderness through Lent. We are in Lent 4, week of wilderness. Um, four weeks of wilderness is a long time. It's been um, time that we have faced wild beasts. We have struggled with temptation. Uh, we've been tired and thirsty in the wilderness. And sometimes when we are walking through the wilderness of life, you just tend to wonder which way are we going? Did we get turned around along the way? Are we headed in the right direction? And sometimes we even wonder, is our effort, does it really matter? Does it really matter what we're doing here, doing this work? The journey in the wilderness 
can be disorienting. Journey in life's wilderness can be confusing. Doubt creeps in. Doubt is often a part of the faith experience. Now, before we even start, I want to share right now, I have doubts about Christianity. How do we teach Jesus? How do we know Jesus? And does the church really do good in the world? I have doubts. I don't believe doubting is a sign that you don't have faith. Doubt, in fact, is our faith with energy and engagement and curiosity. That being said, doubt should never be a destination of our faith. Doubt is a holy step on our faith walk, and it is a step in our wilderness that is worth our time to notice and, and sort of to take measure of and to tend to doubt. So the scriptures this week, I'm going to warn you, if you blink, they will be done. They are very, very, don't get too excited. They are very, we'll make up for it in a few weeks. They are very short. Both passages this week are from the Gospel of Mark and our focus text. The focus text is one verse. And that one verse is the response of a father whose son is not well to Jesus. Let me invite Paula to come on forward and to share with you our very, it'll take her longer to walk up here than for you to hear these scriptures. Good morning. Like Pastor Leanne said, the scriptures today are from the Gospel of Mark. And I will begin with Mark chapter 9, verse 24b in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. And now, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. Gives me great heart. Somebody came to me and said, didn't we read that scripture last week? Yes, we're reading that wilderness passage all through Lent. Every single week, it's the same scripture. If you notice that, yay. Mark 9, 24b. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. Short scripture. So last week we talked about dependence of God on God in the wilderness, in the wilderness of our life. This week, we lean into something that um, I should confess is much more comfortable to talk about, doubt in the wilderness. The good news is with this message this week, well, I'm not going to tell you that doubt is bad. In fact, I'm going to tell you that doubt is good. I am a very pro-doubt kind of pastor, and this is a pro-doubt kind of message. There are many faithful, there are many faithful who have walked with doubt. The great Christian theologian Paul Tillich called faith the state of being ultimately concerned. Thank you, Paul Tillich. The state of being ultimately concerned. 
Paul Tillich was long in the tooth for expressions that are hard to grasp, but his comments on doubt are slightly more accessible, I think. Paul Tillich writes this about doubt. We all know the pain we suffer when we meet people who reject the gospel or meet other people who are not able to make a genuine decision about it since the gospel was never properly communicated to them. Another experience which is, is but slightly less painful, according to Tellick, is to meet those who have accepted the gospel without ever having been able to make a decision about it because it was never a matter of doubt. It came to them as a matter of habit, custom, or social contact. This gospel, he says, can never be. Paul Tillich is saying, if that was muddy for you, Paul Tillich is saying that faith is a state of concern for the most important thing, for life. And Tillich is suggesting that those who claim to have faith, without ever having gone through doubt, don't have faith at all. Team Pro Doubt has a very good following in Christian history and theology. Mark's Gospel, the Gospel of Mark that we heard today, leans into doubt and to unbelief. There are a lot of doubters and skeptics who meet Jesus, who Jesus meets, and he shares the Gospel good news with them. Jesus shows them prayer and the results of faith and faithfulness and God's intervention. So the context of this one single scripture, really, I think, what is the, the full point? Yeah, there's a lot more to it, right? But this one verse has context and content for us in the wilderness as we are walking through that is salient and that is personal. A father, this is a father's words, a father has a son, and that son cannot speak. That son is described as having a spirit that has seized him, dashes the son to the ground regularly, causes him to foam at the mouth, grind his teeth, and go rigid. Jesus asked the father in the context of the full story, how long has this been happening? The father responds back to Jesus, since childhood. Jesus invites the father to bring the son to him. We've seen this over and over again as Jesus says, bring them to me. Come to me. The father asks Jesus, have pity on us. A turning point of the scripture to be sure, the father saying to Jesus, have pity on us. Jesus tells the father, and this will sound very familiar to you. All things can be done for those who believe. And then the father cries out, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. The father's cry and struggle is the focus of our wilderness conversation today. And any parent can well understand the pain of having a child who is suffering and wanting to do anything to help that child, to heal that child, to bring that child comfort. And the cry of the father, the cry of the father in our ears, I think, maybe not, in, in my ears, I believe and help my unbelief. It sounds a little bit like a contradiction. What is the father getting at? What is he trying to say? How does Jesus hear this? I believe. Help my unbelief. How can you believe and have unbelief at the same time? How can we be present to this? And how can this father bring this before Jesus? As you prayerfully consider this, maybe it would make more sense if we said something like, I believe. Help my doubt. I believe. Help my doubt, Jesus. Over Christian history, unfortunately, there have been many who have been dismissed or discounted, doubting, doubters of faith. People are considered 
spiritually immature. They're dismissed, faithfully immature if they say, well, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if that's true. You can fill in the gaps there, I'm sure. I don't know if that really happened. Huh, you must be spiritually immature and really not get it. Didn't you read? Don't you know? Among some, you may be made to feel like a second-class Christian if you question faith, the scriptures. How can you, how can you question? My favorite statement that people make occasionally, uh, a lot, you know, just have faith. You just have to have faith. I think sentences would be better in general if people quit using the word just. You just oughta. Here's one of the other things I want to talk to you about today because I think it's so prevalent and um, we need to reclaim this and, and um, be a different kind of people. We should talk here about something called spiritual gaslighting. Spiritual gaslighting. Gaslighting is when someone undermines some, what someone else is thinking or experiencing to invalidate them. Spiritual gaslighting is undermining or um, invalidating somebody's experience of faith. Gaslighting in general makes you feel crazy, off balance, and it makes you feel like what you think is ridiculous and who you are and how you come to something is just, are you kidding me? Like, really, is that what you believe? Don't you know better? Spiritual gaslighting is when someone uses spirituality or religious concepts to manipulate another person and cause them to question their truth, their perception, and even their sanity. Spiritual gaslighting can be done by anyone, okay? Let me understate this one more time. Spiritual gaslighting and gaslighting in general, religious gaslighting can be done by anyone. Pastors, religious leaders, lay people, non-religious people, anybody you meet. Spiritual gaslighting is sometimes using someone else's faith wounds. The hurt that you have experienced in a religious community, sometimes spiritual gaslighting uses your faith wounds against you to make you feel like your religious beliefs are crazy and that you shouldn't have them. Spiritual and religious gaslighting is sometimes one person taking one scripture, or ritual, or prayer out of context as a means of manipulating another person. An example here might be when someone is confessing, oh, I'm, you know, I'm feeling a little depressed or sad, and the other person says, well, haven't you read Jeremiah 29.11? Don't you know? Hey, Frank, do you know what Jeremiah 29.11 is? Not off the top of his head. Okay, so just stop already. By the way, Frank is one of the most faithful people that we will ever meet. <laughs> Alfred Lord Tennyson said, There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds there are. There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, he says, than in half the creeds there are. If we looked at the lives of those who have doubted through the ages, it would be difficult to conclude that doubt is destructive to faith, or should be something to be avoided. Doubt in our faith is an awful lot like that butterfly pushing out of a cocoon. The butterfly that takes the time to push out of the cocoon little by little and finally getting out of the cocoon needs a little bit of time to flap their wings so that their wings will dry before they can fly away. Spiritual doubts can make you feel lonely, though. According to studies about religion, people who identify as Christians, 65% of them, in the study that I read, said that they have had doubts, that they have wondered, am I right? Is this right? 
Only 35% of faithful people, and I can't, I don't know who those people are, 35% of faithful people say that they have never had any doubts at all. Millennials, men, and those who have gone to college, there's a category, millennials, men, and those who have gone to college are most likely to have had doubts. Go team millennials, men, and those who have gone to college. And 40% of those who have experienced doubt in faith turn to family or friends to talk about that doubt. Only 18% of you spiritual doubters turn to your religious leader. I know, right? <laughs> and that 18% that uh, turns to their uh, religious leaders, that is slightly higher than the 15% uh, of spiritual doubters who sit around and Google it in books and try to find something about doubt. All that is makes it clear that doubting can be awkward. Um, doubting in the wilderness of our life can be awkward, and it can make you feel isolated. It can make you feel crazy. It can make you feel embarrassed. Um, and that's why it's so worth us spending this time on just to lay it out there and be honest about this. Even if you're one of those 35% who has never had any doubts at all, just to be mindful of the people that we walk with and to walk more faithfully together. And to understand that doubt is a powerful and formative experience in the Christian faith. And more than that, and probably even more importantly, that Jesus himself does not seem to be put off. Jesus himself does not seem to be put off by those who don't quite get it for those who are curious, for those who have walked through doubt. Seriously, Peter, have you studied Peter at all? One of the most faithful of Christian followers doubts. And let us not mention or forget Thomas. Jesus tells the good news of love and grace and life and never seems to cast off the questioners, the doubters, the skeptics, the curious. Doubt is a step on the journey of faith. Don't let it be your destination, but also don't miss it as a pathway to deeper faith. In March 1738, just weeks before his Aldersgate experience, John Wesley, the founder of the, the father of the Methodist faith, John Wesley was struggling with doubt. He knew Jesus in his head. John Wesley was a solid religious leader and thinker, and he had religion in his head. He was an ordained Anglican leader, minister, and he was struggling with faith. Our John Wesley went to his mentor, a Moravian friend, Peter Bowler, for advice. Bowler told John Wesley this, Preach faith until you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. John Wesley went to his mentor, Peter Bowler, for advice, and Bowler told John Wesley, who had gone to Oxford and was wise and smart and uh, a leader in the faith, Peter Bowler told John Wesley, preach faith until you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. In other words, act as though you have faith beyond doubt. And then as you act in faith, faith will come to you. We friends are getting closer and closer to Holy Week, closer and closer to the cross that Jesus faces, closer to the moment when Jesus in fact cries out on the cross to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are walking with Christ in the wilderness. God's grace stays with us in the wilderness of our living and all of our days. On our darkest days and on our easiest days, our God is with us in our strength, in our compassion, and in our doubts. God bless you this week in faith.
Amen. I invite us now into that time of turning our attention to God in prayer, opening our hearts and minds and spirits to whatever it is that God has in store for us next. Let us pray. O oh, great and certain God, who despite our fears and our doubts is ever present and ever willing to love us more than we know. Turning to you in prayer is at once the most profound and the simplest act of faith. Entering into a conversation with the divine creator of the universe, and yet somehow, who is our friend. Sometimes that seems daunting. And yet, in the words of Brother Lawrence, a little lifting of the heart suffices. Hear us then, O God, as we lift our hearts to you. Help us to trust that in that lifting, we are heard each and every time, whether in corporate gatherings such as this, as we pause to worship to pray, or in those momentary prayers and praises that burst forth from us as the Spirit moves us to speak to you. In a world of turmoil, grant us calm. In a world of pain, grant us healing. In a world of doubt, Grant us faith. In a world of hate, fill us with love. Strengthen us to keep on keeping on. Remind us that living forward is really the only path to new blessings that we have. And continually remind us that we are not alone, that your presence is all around us and is most evident in the relationships we have in, with one another. There is great resilience great strength, and great healing power found in a community of believers. Thank you, God, for this community gathered in this sanctuary this morning. And as the people gathered, we lift to you special prayers for members of our church family. Be with Ray Ann Worth and her family as they continue to remember Don Worth, whose life was celebrated here yesterday in memorial. Be with Tom Johnston, 
who was in hospital with breathing difficulties. Be with Rob and Marilyn Mathias, both of whom suffered falls this week. Rob was treated at the emergency room and is now home, recovering. We also lift up the following for health concerns. Ed Simpson, recovering from a Bell's palsy. Jim Rogers, who has entered into hospice care. Tracy Wheeler and Aaron Frazier and Audrey Shaw for ongoing health concerns. We also lift up other members of the church and for the extended families of our congregation, friends and relatives, co-workers and acquaintances who have been listed on our prayer lists. And finally, Lord, we earnestly pray for the people of the Ukraine who face the terrible cost of an unjust war. Bring, bring peace where there is no peace and healing where lives are broken. We pray for the future of the nations and for our nation as dissension and divisiveness seem to be relentless and ongoing. We are so often stunned by what we see and hear, we find it difficult to pray about anything. Refresh our inner souls so that lifting up our hearts to you becomes the first response. In that way, O oh God, we may regain our balance, reclaim our faith, and thereby become the beacons of light we are called to be. Grant the rekindling of our hearts to this hour of worship, and let us carry that light and love into the world, even as Christ called us to do. And therefore, with the confidence of the people of God, let us share together the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
we come now to that time that is our call to offering and action. This congregation is different than others in that we are very clear. We find our faith through not just uh, one thing, but through many things. We are a people of faith whose faith is deep and wide. If you're having a bad day and you want to grow your faith closer to God, don't come put money in the offering plate. Make a plan to go out and spend a couple of hours to care for somebody else. With this moment, I want you to think about that. This week, how can you grow your faith by taking time, one hour, two hours, to call a few people, to do something good in the world, to send a few cards to people who are recovering or need prayer, who just pop up on your, on your heart's radar? Call to offering in action is as much a call to using your time and talents as a person of faith to be faithful. How will you spend your time this week? Consider it now and, and, and let that be part of your offering. Imagine in your mind, in your heart, your offering before God to your neighbor to your family, to your community. If your spiritual gift is giving, this congregation has a lot of things that we need to do, that we are called to do, that you have said we want to do. If your spiritual gift is funding our operating budget, then I encourage you, I welcome you, I, I ask you to consider that also. And during our closing hymn, I invite you to bring forth any offering you have for our offering box. It will go to the work of this congregation as we serve God in this world. Let your mind and your heart now make a plan for your offering and action in God's name. Let us join now in a word of prayer as we dedicate all of that back to our God. Let us pray. O oh God, plentiful in love and mercy, we greet you with our worship and our praise. We offer hymns of joy and thanksgiving. We offer our time and our talents. We now pause to offer to you our coins, which we pray will be used in your service and for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who was rich, but for our sakes became poor. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as you are able as we share our closing song.
George Hooper always says, lost in wonder, what is it, Frank? Lost in wonder, love, and praise. You can do worse than quote that regularly. Friends, fellow doubters on the journey, go forth into the world, confident of God's great love for you today and always. In Christ's name, amen.